Um, thank you so much for having us. Uh, thanks to Moritz, Mark, and Stanford in general for uh, having this group together. Uh, it's, it's an extraordinarily cl collection of people, um, and thank you for, for joining. Um, there was a famous Hollywood TV show recently about a Silicon Valley company that was creating a quantum computer, uh, and they, instead of isolating the quantum chip, they isolated the office building. So they had to cross, across, uh, they had to cross a uh, electromagnetic gap, uh, they're using a special elevator, uh, and it was isolated from heat and seismic activity. Um, the arguments over the zero Kelvin uh, AC uh, in the office must have been interesting. Uh, and then they, they, what, what they did, they successfully built this quantum computer, uh, and then what happened is uh, essentially uh, once they did that, their first demo, uh, in their first demo, they recreated or they created a simulacrum, uh, simulacrum of Jesus walking around that was historically accurate. So this is not the most realistic depiction of quantum technology or computing. In reality, if physicists had this capability, they would have created uh, Richard Feynman playing the bongos. But so, you know, the point of, of all of this and of this panel is to give um, this group and eventually the public policy universe a better understanding of what quantum applications are. If we look at AI today, I would argue that it's a little bit of a train wreck, right? And it's a train wreck in several dimensions. We've got, or, uh, uh, you know, in, on the one hand, we have uh, the EU promulgating regulations that don't necessarily look at the benefits of AI. On the other hand, we've got America, where we don't have, it's a little bit more of the libertarian dream or nightmare, depending on your political predilections, where you know, kids could be exposed to all, all kinds of uh, defamatory and, and uh, nasty stuff. Um, and then you have a third monster out there with AI regulation that I call the space tornado. And the space tornado is that the speed and scale, the compounding effect of AI automatons that are released into the wild, is so disjunctive that the government can't catch up, right? And so there's this speed and scale issue. We, we've gotten AI wrong, even though there's an interesting foment in this sphere. To get it right, we need to understand what the heck we're talking about, and that's why these experts are here today. Um, I'll introduce each of them in, um, in time. We're starting us off with uh, Karina Chu, uh, who is the COO, the Chief Operating Officer of uh, powerhouse Google Quantum AI. Um, uh, Karina also worked at one of my and, and some of our favorite past clients, OSTP. Uh, OSTP is the Office of Science and Technology Policy at the White House. They help the president and through the president, the other branches of the U.S. government set policy for us. And with that, Karina, take it away. Awesome. Thanks, Joshua. Hey, everybody. Really happy to be here today, and I have to say thanks to Moritz and the organizers, too. I was an undergrad at Stanford chemistry major, specialized in quantum chemistry, and a music minor. So this conference is literally three of my favorite things in one. Um, look, I think we get the question oftentimes, you know, why try to build a quantum computer? Why is quantum computing interesting? Why should Google try to build a quantum computer? And to Joshua's comments, look, it'd be awesome to have Jesus walking around or Richard Feynman playing the bongos, right? But I'll ask a question to the audience. Imagine you have a super tall closet that has a million drawers. And imagine that I were to hide something in one of those drawers. How many drawers would you have to open on average in order to find it? got a million drawers, I hid something in one of them, how many drawers on average do you need to open to find it? 500,000. 500,000, nailed it, exactly. So on average, you would have to open 500,000. That is, with classical search, you need n number of drawers, a million, divided by two, n over two. If you had a quantum computer, how many drawers would you need to open on average to find it? Root n, yes, exactly. So if you had a million drawers with a quantum computer, your search goes with the scale of root n, where you'd only have to open 1,000. So compare 500,000 with classical search, 1,000 with uh, quantum search. You can imagine you know, why this could be a very valuable element. And um, I'll add to that, right? This is just a problem of unstructured search. Um, this is going according to Grover's algorithm. There are lots of other applications and potential algorithms and things out there where you could do 
worse than root end, but you could also do much better than root end. One of the biggest tricks and that one of the biggest investments right now is trying to figure out what are all the different ways where a quantum computer can do something faster, more powerfully, more cheaper, you know, um, more efficiently than classical search. There could be massive problems out there. We believe there are, and this is why we want to invest in it. Um, the next point I want to make is this is a super hard problem, an actual working quantum computer that could solve Grover's algorithm or others like it um, does not exist right now. We've got lots of smaller samples of processors that people have tried, much simpler scale. I brought some photos and we can pass them around the group too so people can take a look. Um, this is a photo of one of our Google quantum AI processors. Um, this photo has about 54 qubits um, on the chip. So you can take a look, you can see roughly kind of the um, structure of the chip and, and how it's laid out. We've got about 100 qubits right now. Um, that's kind of where state of the art is on the order of hundreds of qubits. It's estimated in order to solve a lot of the types of problems that people really care about, we're going to have to get to a million qubits. So at 100 today, we need to go four more orders of magnitude towards a million qubits to solve some of these tough problems. Now, quantity is not the only element that matters. A lot of times people think about quantity. All right, so you can get to 100, you can get to 400, 1,000, just keep pushing it, you'll get where you need to go. You need a million qubits. You also need those qubits to be good. Right now, the very best processors, including the ones that we have at Google, make about one error in every 100 algorithmic steps, um, which is fine. You know, It's been really the result of a lot of breakthroughs. However, to get to the ultimate quantum computers that we really want to use for all sorts of problems, um, it's estimated that you're going to need to make only one error in about a million steps. So again, we make about one error in 100 steps today. We need to be able to perform a million algorithmic steps with only one error to really do anything useful. So that's another four orders of magnitude on quality. We've got to push the boundaries on all of them. Um, as I mentioned, this is a photo of our processor. Here's another photo I'll pass around. You can see um, the processor that I just showed, it's a smaller one. That's about 54 qubits. The larger one, we're going to about 72. That was a couple years worth of work to go from 54 to 72. As I said, we've got to try to get to a million, and we've tried to, um, got to try to increase the uh, quality quite a bit. Um, so just to underscore, it's a worthwhile problem. It's also a very hard problem. The last picture that I'll show around is of our cryostat. The types of quantum computing systems that we are pursuing at Google are with superconducting silicon qubits. Um, there's lots of different types of platforms that other people are trying to use. Um, for superconducting silicon qubits, you need to go down to low temperatures. I think Joshua also alluded to this. You can see our cryostats. We load the processor right in the side and get the qubits down to near zero temperatures, 10 millikelvin. Um, so I'll just pass these around so people can take a look. I um, think there's lots of really interesting things we can talk about, but really want to underscore it's going to be an awesome, very challenging uh, process. Thank you so much. I, I, uh, I'll collect the photos later. Thank you so much. Uh, next, we have uh, Florian Newcart. Uh, and uh, Florian is the Chief Product Officer of Terra Quantum AG. Um, uh, Dr. Newcart, everyone here, by the way, is a doctor except me, so I'm the ignorant lawyer in the group. Um, uh, um, Florian is, uh, in addition to have spending many, many years at Volkswagen, uh, working in quantum and other super high-tech, difficult um, uh, technical areas, he's also the co-author of Germany's Quantum Roadmap. So, and, and a lot of you here are at the boundaries between law and regulation and governance and, and what we do, uh, uh, Dr. Dr. Chu as well. Um, the, if you haven't experienced, and I'll go to his, get his slides ready in a second. There we go. Um, by the way, these slides, though they're marked confidential to close the loop with the last speaker, these are not actually confidential, uh, so we can share them with you today. So, Florian, uh, over to you. Thank you very much. Um, you hear me well? Yes. So, um, yeah, our slide, our templates, they always come with this strictly um, private and confidential, so you can ignore that for today's talk. Um, I'm very happy to be here and very happy to have such a broad audience here to be able to talk about quantum computing, quantum technologies, if we want to, a little later in the breaks. Um, today I'll focus on, on quantum computing and where we stand with hybrid quantum computing, which is a mildly different approach than pure quantum computing, so where we only leverage 
uh, quantum chips to uh, obtain some results. And um, we'll see what we can do with this today and uh, what the trajectory is for the future. Uh, very briefly on Terra Quantum. So Terra Quantum is a quantum technology company, which means that we are active in all pillars of quantum technology. So as we've heard today, there is not only quantum computing, there is quantum sensing, cryptography, there is imaging, um, and um, there's computing. So and there are, depending on how you define it more, so you have to measure these systems, which then comes to metrology. So also this could be defined as quantum technology pillar. But in short, uh, in all of these, we do hard and software development, and we try to leverage um, uh, all the research results across these pillars. So very often when we develop things, so let's say a measurement device for quantum computers, we can also use that to build sensors. So magnetometers, for example, that we can use, for example, to measure disturbances in the Earth's magnetic field or the like. Um, Terra Quantum is currently about 250 people strong. It's headquartered in Switzerland, in St. Gallen, um, but we have offices also. So here in the US and uh, Germany, Austria, Finland, where we have one hardware location, uh, Naples and Italy, where we also build hardware. Um, very briefly on, on the hybrid approach, um, how it looks to an end user. Um, hybrid means that we combine classical high performance computing with quantum computing. So, and anytime I say classical, I mean those computers that are not quantum computers that don't use quantum effects for computation. And uh, the combination goes beyond offering these two computing paradigms in the cloud. There goes a lot more into that, which is, for example, development of an operating system, which we have that handles the load distribution. So what goes to quantum and what goes to classical chips? And then on top, we have uh, the hybrid libraries that also need to be able to leverage these capabilities. You can imagine it as sort of having software developed on top that has a big block of computing hardware to its avail. And depending on the nature of the problem, say a machine learning problem, deep learning is very prominent. Um, we have uh, maybe 5% quantumness in this problem in one iteration uh, when we train these algorithms. <clears throat> Um, there are very canonical examples that I brought, so these are uh, not um, uh, uh, very ex existential, but uh, so in the end, it shows already that we can do things with hybrid algorithms that you cannot do with purely classical algorithms in the same amount of time, uh, or even solve uh, um, at scale. So on the left-hand side, you see an example for optimization, so compare a hybrid algorithm um, that we built with a, a very prominent optimization solver, CPLEX. There are many more uh, optimization solvers that are commonly used in, in industry, but the example comparison that we see here shows that for solving um, a canonical problem, in that case a fully connected weighted graph, um, we can solve it in 20 minutes as compared to CPLEX, which keeps plateauing uh, even if you give it hours. It means, doesn't mean it doesn't find a good solution, it just means for that problem it doesn't find a better one. And that is usually true for all optimizations that we look at, but I'm very hesitant to give a universal promise here. Um, the same is true for machine learning. When we look at the middle uh, pillar here, the example that we see here uh, is a comparison on the same hardware, same classical hardware, um, between a hybrid quantum algorithm and a purely classical algorithm. And uh, it's a neural network that we look at, and uh, you can see the purple curve, that's the hybrid algorithm. That's the trajectory or the curve that you want to see because it shows that we're both faster when we train the algorithm and both more accurate when we supply it with new data, so data that it hasn't seen while it was trained, which is usually what you want. Think about self-driving vehicles, um, we train um, neural networks for detecting um, people, for identifying traffic signs, for even doing behavioral cloning. But there, was always, uh, there will always be situations that you did not encounter in the training data, so the algorithm must be capable of handling that, and that is what we see here. And lastly, when it comes to simulation, usually when we talk about simulation in the context of quantum computing, we talk about simulating physics and chemistry, so um, simulating the quantum effects that are at play at these scales. Um, here too, in that case with a purely classical quantum-inspired algorithm though, we outperform existing classical algorithms. And um, I brought a couple more practical examples just to show what we have been doing with customers and that you can see what, what's possible today. Um, so all these examples that we see here, we did with customers. And um, not all of them made it into production yet, but most of them are in the process of going into production. Um, the two examples that I want to talk uh, a little more about today are uh, the one that we uh, just uh, had a press release on, uh, I think, last week. It was a satellite mission planning for Thales, the problem. 
uh, or the nature of the problem is very complex. So in the end, what they have is a couple of satellites in the orbit, and these satellites um, execute a mission. Uh, one mission could be uh, follow the weather patterns and, and do um, um, provide data for weather prediction. Uh, but then uh, it may happen that there is a second mission that needs to be added, mapping, for example. And then a third mission could come. So imagine there is a forest fire, and these satellites now need to um, track this forest fire. So uh, while executing all these missions, we want to have maximum coverage for all these missions, which makes it a complicated optimization problem. So how do you optimal, optimally uh, plan these trajectories of the satellites very close to real time? And uh, this is what we solved with a hybrid algorithm and beat the existing solution that they had in, in production. And this is now moving into production. And second, uh, one other thing that I want to show is um, with another company, a chemical company, Evonik. Um, what they do, so they are um, very interested in the mixing process, so when you bring together chemicals. Um, and that is interestingly not uh, a problem that you can only simulate. So in the end, what you have to do when you bring together different fluids or very various uh, components. There is pressure, there is temperature that plays a role into the chemical reaction. So uh, how do you design that mixer specifically for one mixing process? You can do that simulation, and the simulation, um, they, will, uh, they will not be accurate enough, so you have to design manually this mixer and uh, test it, uh, and we sped up that process. And I, I think I'm nearing the end of my five minutes, right? Just <laughs> not nearly enough time. No. Thank you. For, <laughs> Thank you very much. This is amazing. Yes. We can talk about everything. Um, more later. Uh, Thank sure. you very much. Um, Thank you so much. As you can see, the applications are myriad, even using hybrid approaches. And um, they remind us a little bit about the laser light, the yellow light experiment, where AI was used to do an optimization problem. So real, you know, being realistic about this is important, but also uh, there's some real applications. Uh, Dr. Grant Salton uh, is um, uh, a senior research scientist at Amazon Quantum Science um, Solutions, Amazon Quantum Solutions. Um, he is also a visiting researcher at Caltech. But the, the super cool thing that I learned about Grant, that's not necessarily on his bio on the web, and you should look at all the, these people's uh, bios, they're, they're incredible, uh, is he was on the wormhole paper. So I'll let, you, I'll let him describe a little bit. I'm sure we have time to cover all that as well. Uh, Grant, take it away. Yeah, thanks. I, I may skip over that part entirely, uh, but feel free to ask <laughs> it, me later. It, it is a wormhole for the conference <laughs> organizers as well. Yeah. Uh, great. Um, yeah, so thanks. It's, it's really exciting to be here back on the farm. Uh, I think actually, interesting, I used to live right there up in this building uh, in grad school, so it's, it's great to be right here. Um, I only have a couple minutes, so I thought what I would do is just tell you mostly about what we're doing under the umbrella of quantum technologies mm -hmm. at AWS. And there's several different efforts, but uh, I'll just tell you the four main pillars. So there's Amazon Bracket, which is an AWS service, uh, part of the AWS cloud for running quantum workloads. There are two research institutes. There's the Centers for Quantum Computing and Quantum Networking. And then there's the, the fourth pillar, which is the Amazon Quantum Solutions Lab. That's part of AWS Professional Services. Um, OK, so first up is this Amazon Bracket uh, service. This is part of AWS. It's like all the other uh, cloud services from AWS. But it's a way of letting customers design, build, test, and run quantum workloads in the AWS cloud. It gives you access to quantum hardware devices from third-party vendors. Um, you can see a suite of them here. There are superconducting chips, there are ion trap devices, there are photonic devices, neutral atoms, things like that. As well, we also have uh, a, a, another suite of managed quantum simulators. These let you test a quantum circuit or some kind of quantum workload before you send it to hardware. And the nice thing about these is that they're, they're managed in the sense that you don't actually have to worry about all the classical infrastructure of doing a large-scale simulation of a quantum system. Uh, that's done for you. Second pillar was this uh, AWS Center for Quantum Computing. This is a research institute that's physically located on campus at Caltech in Pasadena, California. Um, not everybody from the Center for Quantum Computing is there. We have some folks actually in the Bay Area but, uh, and, and pretty delocalized, but the bulk of the effort is there on campus. And it's nicely uh, tied to the Caltech community. There, there is some good collaboration there. Um, the, the Center for Quantum Computing has a mandate to work on the deep fundamental research required to bring fault-tolerant quantum computers to fruition. Uh, and as we've heard, this is a very difficult challenge. There's a lot of scientific and engineering challenges ahead of us. And so this is long-reach uh, scientific um, uh, effort. So I was asked to try to bring some sort of hardware, but it turns out that these are really sensitive devices. And my experimentalist friends were not thrilled about just letting a theorist walk out of the lab with one. So I have a photo. Um, <laughs> 
the best I could do, I apologize. What you're seeing here is some of the packaging hardware for housing one of the quantum chips that would go sort of in the, the central aluminum bit. And uh, this, this packaging hardware also allows you to connect a lot of the classical control devices that are needed to operate on the qubits that would be stored in the center when this is down at cold temperatures. Cool. The next uh, pillar of the quantum effort at AWS is this Amazon, sorry, the AWS Center for Quantum Networking. That's a research institute that's in collaboration with Harvard, but it doesn't have as, uh, such nice photos. It's a little newer. Instead of doing the research required to bring quantum computers to fruition, these folks are working on other technologies like quantum networking. So doing quantum secure cryptography, entanglement-based communication, uh, you know, things that are needed to, to, uh, to set up a network that allows you to send and receive quantum information. And then finally, there's the Amazon Quantum Solutions Lab, and this is part of AWS Professional Services. This is another research group, so you hear research comes up quite often because this is a, a long-term stretch goal, but um, this is a research group that is in collaboration with external customers, and customers here can really, it's sort of a broadly defined term. It could be major financial institutions, it could be major automotive companies, it could be government labs, academic labs, could be you know, an interested uh, individual who wants some expert help. And this team is a, it's a group of research scientists, all of whom have some sort of background in quantum computing or quantum information theory or some kind of quantum technology, um, uh, typically through an academic track. But then also, many of these scientists have uh, deep expertise in things like machine learning, high performance computing, classical optimizations research. You know, it's, a, it's a pretty diverse team. And the, the goal here is to do some of the, the cutting edge research that's required to uh, understand the impact, the impact and uh, applicability of quantum computers to problems that customers care about, uh, and ideally using some sort of interdisciplinary, um, multi-stream approach to solving the problem. Uh, it's not, it's, it's, a, it's a, a solution agnostic team that does not really require uh, any one particular technology to be at the forefront, whatever is solving the problem best, but ideally we try to find something that also uses quantum computing because we're the quantum solutions lab. Uh, now, through these interactions with customers, we have a lot of use cases that we've identified that are kind of of interest, and I'm showing here just one slide, um, primarily with financial services, because I've had a bit more you know, overlap with some financial services of late. Um, but there are a couple of key use cases that come up time and again. So, you know, up, up top there's portfolio optimization and derivative pricing and things like that, and, and we hear uh, a lot of interest. Let me explain the, the kind of funky color scheme here. So each of these use cases has four boxes. If the box is filled with a color, it means we have a solution strategy in mind. If it's not, it means we haven't, we haven't thought of one that um, we find really compelling. The colors are, uh, the, you know, the first box, green, that's traditional, regular high-performance computing, a way of solving this on a regular computer using uh, just throwing a lot of compute at it. The blue box is some sort of machine learning-based approach. Pink is a quantum technology, a quantum strategy, and then orange is something that we may get into a little bit more in the panel, but this is something that we're calling nature-inspired optimization. So this is solving a hard problem that we care about using a technique that is uh, a little bit different, using regular classical hardware, but approaching it by understanding how nature would solve a related problem. And then last thing I'll say is uh, that was for finance, but we have collected a lot of these use cases from several different industries uh, and, and our, our friends and and AWS have helped us do this. So if you're interested, please chat with me later. Um, th that was amazing. And again, we, we only have time to really just scratch the surface of the applications uh, and, and the problems, right, in the way of doing this um, successfully. Um, and now we have JPL, if you'll give me one moment. Here we go. Uh, Dr. Edward Chow is the manager of the Civil Program Office at NAS NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory. Um, JPL, in addition to bringing us the Webb Telescope, one of the coolest devices not on the Earth or uh, including the Earth, um, uh, he is, uh, has, has dealt with an enormous number in the civil applications area and, and, and in deep science, um, an enormous number of, of applications. Uh, he also teaches at USC as a, uh, as a uh, visiting professor, a research professor. Um, and uh, with that, I will let him take it away. Um, but again, he's a, 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 like the other panelists here, has an enormous amount of experience with um, applied problems uh, also. Okay, thank you. Uh, so first, I want to uh, clarify that, um, you know, yes, just like Joshua said, I'm from JPL, not from NASA Ames. <laughs> There's this, this a big difference uh, because NASA Ames, they do a lot of quantum computing work, where JPL, we do uh, 
uh, deep space exploration. That's why Sorry. you know most of our focus is actually on uh, on uh, on sensing really uh, activity. So so uh, so I think the the the, the main difference is uh, you know um, you know in, in this panel probably we focus more on, on sensing. Uh, here are just a couple examples of uh, quantum sensing. Um, you know we think quantum sensing is going to have. Uh, a huge impact, especially uh, it may have uh, some short-term impact uh, uh, in terms of the uh, the ethics and, and law and so on. So, so it's, so on the on my right hand side is um, uh, is the um, uh, you know, upper right is the uh, quantum gravity gradiometer. Um, you know, we build this to sense uh, the uh, the gravitational field of Earth. Um, and we're building uh, um, you know, space qualified uh, instrument, and uh, hopefully, eventually, what this will lead to a, uh, to a, a you know a space mission. Uh, on the upper left hand side, you see uh, that's um, uh, another quantum uh, technology we're building. It's called quantum uh, RIBOR radar. Uh, it's using a RIBOR atom, and then uh, the nice thing about RIBOR atom is uh, is um, that single little vacuum tube. Um, you know, can cover the entire spectrum. Uh, so you, you can see, you know, uh, you know, um, you know, from from L band, you know, all the way to KU, the entire spectrum. What, what does that mean? That means, you know, using uh, using one satellite. You know, we have potential of um, of sensing, uh, you know, from you know the thickness of ice and all the way down to uh, um, the soil moisture. You know, understand the uh, the moisture um, level of soil, uh, you know, in, in soil. Um, and also look at tree moisture and many many other things. So so, so, so has wide range of application. The the, the key difference in in, in quantum uh, sensing is um, using in, using quantum technology. We can actually make many of the things that's not possible before become possible. Right. Now, for example, right um, with the uh, with the um, uh, the the RIBOR, uh, quantum RIBOR uh, radar uh, by using a signal opportunity. That means we're not. Generating you know, active signal, we're, we're using the signal uh, from from all the other satellites that are, are already out there, thousands of, of those already out there. We can sense uh, the entire spectrum, right? And that means in the past, for, when we have a you know L band you know uh, satellite, we need antenna that big, right? And and right now we can build it that big. Right? By doing that, uh, we can actually put up you know thousands of this, and then can provide basically. A, Many of the things that that we we couldn't see before. All right, so this this is this is a um, you know really you know kind of revolutionary all right, in terms of what what they can do. All right, um, and, and same thing with with quantum gravity gradiometer instead of two spacecraft with a Grace mission, now we can actually build it into one. You know, um, uh, you know we we we're also doing. Um, because uh, space mission is very expensive, uh, so we, so we want to create virtual laboratory. So the, the picture uh, below, you can see that, that now we're taking a um, you know, physical lab of a Mars yard, and we're, we're trying to build that into uh, into the entire virtual uh, virtual environment. You know, with um, you know virtual robots and uh, photorealistic robot AI agent, and so on. And this summer, we this summer we have um, you know ten uh, intern students. Um, uh, they are uh, they are building a, a, a project project for South Pole of Mars, exploration of South Pole of Mars, where we, um, we have um, you know, uh, basically a group of, of, um, of um, robots, uh, AI robots, and they are, they are exploring Mars. All right? It's not a swarm, they're kind of you know, exploring collaboratively. All right? In this case, um, the, 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 the robot need to be able to, um, to, sit, uh, to get data from other robots and work uh, collaboratively. They need to uh, replan uh, dynamically, um, and this, so 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 this involved you know getting data and also getting um, you know getting doing dynamic optimization uh, and uh, and so on. So 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 um, so so with, with with this kind of technology, with, especially with the recent development of um, of all the AI large language model and so on, we're gradually shifting from from you know you know, you go to web and search information to 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 this active information you know coming to you right so you want to to have these um, you know uh, oracle which kind of kind of tell you you know what's right and what's wrong hopefully right and and this is where the ai agent become become very very important all right uh, and we're trying to build ai agent with our, our summer students have ai agent talking to ai agent and so the reason i, I bring this up is is 
uh, is um, you know, we're actually trying to combine this with some of, some of our, 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 our quantum activity, right? If you know uh, we have quantum sensing that can provide you know uh, many of the things we cannot see before, and this AI agent can automatically um, you know access those data, right? Um, with many of the data, the AI agent can access. AI agent can actually build trust with you. Right. Uh, we, 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 in the last seven years, we've been building a, um, you know, AI agent for Homeland Security Department to support uh, you know, um, you know, a first responder application. In, in those cases, uh, we are you know, very careful in terms of what data we, we can use, what data we cannot use for privacy reasons, and so on. You know, using, using sensor, you know, quantum sensor, uh, with the, sens the level of sensitivity that has never previously seen before with uh, pervasiveness, um, then, then potentially, you know, we can we can access you know provide this AI agent with um, tremendous amount of data, right? So, so for example, you know, as as we're you know moving in this room, um, you know, th this room is actually filled with uh, uh, electromagnetic wave, right? So, so I'm I'm actually perturbing the electromagnetic wave. So potentially, you know, with uh, the sensitivity of AI agent, uh, you know, uh, quantum quantum sensor sensing, you know, I can actually be tracked any time. Right, I can actually, um, um, you know, have many of the information which is, is impossible before. With that, the AI agent needed in order to 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 give you um, confidence, give you the information that you can trust. But at the same time, you know, we don't have the the, the past, you know, AI agent that will work with Homeland Security that were very careful in terms of selecting data. So now all the AI agents dynamically accessing all this data. Now the AI agents accessing many of the data now that these quantum sensors provide to us that we couldn't even imagine before. So, so, um, so, so I, I believe this is going to be a very interesting, um, you know, um, uh, decade uh, forward. And I think the quantum sensing probably within the next, uh, you know, um, few years, you know, two to five years, you're going to see many of the quantum sensing impact uh, coming uh, into play uh, with, uh, with ethic and law and so on, probably even sooner than quantum computing. Thank you. Uh, uh, that is wonderful. Thank you so much. And I'm proud to say I did not confuse uh, Dr. Chow with these gentlemen of the same name from Ames. But uh, anyway, thank you so much. And again, we can compare uh, uh, Dr. Chow's comments, um, you know, about the revolution being within two to five years with some of the, the sobriety um, that Dr. Chu mentioned in terms of quantity and quality, right? And we're interested in exploring where are the roadblocks, uh, what's, what's preventing us society from taking advantage of these things, uh, and where do we need to collaborate? My first question, and we'd love to open it up to you for questions as soon as possible, um, uh, whether technical or policy or otherwise, you're all, all of you have um, uh, really interesting collaborations, both within the organization. I mean, Google itself is like a university and a government and a company and many, many things at once, but, uh, it, but you're also collaborating with uh, universities. Sorry, feel free to correct. Um, Amazon obviously has, has multiple elements and it has a lab at Caltech. How, how do some of these things work? Like in, in whether right now or ideally, and where do you draw boundary areas between your organizations and others? And, and how, do you, how do you manage to do deep science, sometimes in commercial organizations, uh, or to commercialize within um, you know, public policy organizations like uh, JPL? So uh, Karina, do you want to start us off, and then uh, we can go down? Sure. Yeah, happy to. I think you hit on it, um, Joshua. The partnership is critical. Right, you look around at how big some of the problems are that we've been talking about on the panel. You know, I'll focus on quantum computing. We think it's going to be, um, it's a very important effort to try to build a quantum computer. It's also a very ambitious and very hard effort. Um, there's no way any one team has all of the expertise needed, right, across not even just, you know, if you look at technical expertise alone, you know, no one person, no one small team has all of the expertise in quantum science, in physics, in modeling, electronics, cryogenics, um, wiring, packaging. There's so many different elements that are needed to even just try to build some of the chips, let alone how do you think about applications? How do you think about, you know, speed ups and societal impacts and how to get these things done? Partnership is absolutely the name of the game. So um, inside of Google, certainly we've got lots of different teams that have different expertise that we can lean on. Maybe they're experts in ASICs development or in um, electronics, in large scale, you know, machine learning models, hyper 
performance computing. I think there's lots of teams we collaborate with, and of course, software engineers. Um, and then, you know, externally, you know, and I think Joshua mentioned a paper that Grant had collaborated on, but there's lots. I think every year we have um, published probably on the order of 30 to 40 papers, and most of those have academic collaborators on them, right? Because academia feel, um, fills a very unique position, right? And people in academia can try out lots of new things. They have different ideas. They can try things on a small scale. We try to engineer them and scale them up at Google. So um, academic partnerships are absolutely important. And then um, government, and maybe we're going to get into this I mean, given the law school too, but um, government plays an enormous role both in terms of investing in the technologies and the basic science and, you know, things like the CHIPS Act in the U.S. that passed last summer. Um, all of these types of investments are super important. And then on the flip side, thinking about the right types of regulation and controls that are needed to develop safely. To follow up on that quick before we move to our, our next panelist, what is the right type of regulation, right? You, you were, um, again, at the White House, you were managing all this enormous amounts of complexity. Anything, and, and, and it's a huge success that we have this academic commercial collaboration. That's enormously successful. It didn't have to, it could be alchemy, right, that we could be dealing with. What what would you tweak about either the private legal universe or the government universe, if anything, um, or is that too complex a question to answer right now? I mean, there's I, I hopefully we'll get into it. It's very very big question, so I think a lot to say. Maybe if I just commented one um, immediate thing that I would tweak, we absolutely need to have better communication and dialogue between the sectors. So you know, people in government really better understanding how the technology works and what makes sense in terms of you know regulatory proposals and ideas. And then on the flip side, I think people in industry and technology better understanding the real implications, um, not being naive around geopolitics or you know lots of other elements out there um, to work together. Wonderful. Uh, uh, Florian, Dr. Newcart, you know, Volkswagen is obviously has an incredible industrial, um, uh, both skill sets and, and, and now you're working in, um, obviously in Switzerland as well and other countries. Um, and, and, and Germany is unique, of course, in that it has the Works Council, um, you know, the, the the, the policy environment is very unique as well. It's incredible. What would you say both about organizational interconnections, whether government or academic or otherwise, uh, and then also in terms of policy tweaks you might make? Mm -hmm. So I couldn't agree more with what has been said. So collaborations between uh, industry and, and research academic institutions is very, very important. So um, also at Volkswagen, which is uh, a much bigger company than the one that I am working at right now, um, there is expertise, uh, external expertise needed to solve certain problems. And um, there is always the IP question. Um, so very often, so specifically now I, I have my other glasses, the startup glasses. When I work at a small company, it's very important that we secure our IP, but still um, the partnerships are important. So how do we do that efficiently? So it's very hard sometimes to work um, on grant projects because grant projects require you either to share your IP or to make it at least open. Um, but in the end, we want to be the ones that develop a product based on uh, a collaborative effort that we can sell and ship and that is unique. So that's a question that we always have to tackle and that we always have to worry about, so to say. Um, but um, in the end, um, coming back to the, to the first point, uh, we don't know everything. So that's why a collaboration is very important. Collaboration also with industry. So either so thinking about both company scales now, the big one and the, the smaller one. So working with other uh, companies and, and trying to solve um, a problem that concerns not only these companies, but many people. Traffic flow optimization was one of these um, problems that Volkswagen is and was very interested in. So how can you um, make products that go uh, for, on one hand uh, into your vehicles so, and uh, help you or help drivers to avoid traffic jam, but then how do you collaborate with other manufacturers? Is that something that's possible? And here again, the IP question comes up, but I think we have to think bigger here and uh, think about the end customer and the user. And uh, for the smaller ones, um, what we do, so in startup classes now again, we, we very often go into partnerships with companies and develop joint products. Uh, so for one, we say our technology is ready today, it's ready for productive use, 
But then uh, in industry, there is very often hesitation. So as, as Grant said um, before, an industry customer may be interested in solving a problem, but they don't care too much about what technology it is that brings the solution to the problem. Is it cheaper? Is it cost of integration? Is that low? Can you do it better than we can do it now? And uh, that often results then in industry partnerships and developing joint products and jointly owning the IP. So these are the questions that mostly um, I wouldn't say worry us, but that we think about a lot. Um, those, are, those are great things to, to open up. Um, Dr. Chow, you're, you're at the, you run the civil program office. Could you tell us a little bit about how that works with not just interns, but any, any collaboration? Yeah, you know, it, 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 you know, collaboration is just like all the other panelists said. Collaboration is extremely important uh, to us. Um, you know, nobody knows everything, and uh, and uh, we, you know, we when we you know build our project, we work with a partner um, you know throughout the world. Uh, for example, you know, German DR, CSRI, and you know many you know many uh, organizations around the world, and also uh, universities. Um, uh, and, and so, um, you know, one 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 thing is, um, you know, for example, like I mentioned, our summer project. Summer project actually has participation of um, of multiple, uh, uh, in, um, um, you know, companies. All right? So, so not just not just uh, intern a company actually support us. One nice thing of, of being a being a, a lab is we can actually, you know, kind of, you know, bring a, bring everybody together and kind of. Do this thing, you know, and uh, we we ask everyone to be as open as possible, you know, and then we can all experiment. Every, everyone can 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 uh, can learn together. It will probably be a lot easier than than, than a company, uh, you know. But but yeah, but we we um, we, we we fully realize that that you know each one of us we bring uh, different capability when we when we put it all together, it will benefit uh, all, and we're, we're we're doing that in in our current missions and so on. Thank you so much. Um, and then uh, Grant, Dr. Selden. Uh, so. Yeah, so we, we have as well, I mean, uh, we have a, a lot of academic and, uh, and external collaborations. It's not, it, it's not something that we can do um, in-house entirely on our own, right? There's, there's a lot of science that needs to be done and one needs to understand what everybody else around the world is doing to be able to move the envelope. Um, there's a perspective on this that I have uh, through these interactions with the customers, which is a little bit different in that uh, here, you know, we're, there's often a, a sense of, well, let's talk about IP uh, and, and how does that, that enter here. Um, this depends a little bit on the, on the use case that's being solved and it depends a little bit on what the end goal of the project is. So just to give you an example, right, oftentimes the projects that I'm, that I'm supporting with, with a customer is meant to, the end goal is to do research and publish a paper uh, and say, look, here's some science. It's a little harder to try to say, all right, well, what, what intellectual property are we trying to protect here? And sometimes there is a discussion uh, around this, but if the end goal is anyway to put this out and say, look, here, we're, we're really trying to become a, a thought leader or something, uh, what's, the, what's the, the goal there? So something that I'd like to see that I think would help with some of these collaborations are, are just, um, just sort of increasing, yeah, I guess actually, as Karina mentioned, increasing awareness, not just within government, but within the supporting organizations, even internal to, uh, to each individual company, right? Oftentimes we need support from our legal teams or from uh, a sales team or something like this, and there needs to be an interaction with, with the same team on the customer side, and there's just a bit of a you know, hesitancy around quantum computing. It's brand new, it's exciting, there's a lot of buzzwords, a lot of hype. Uh, and so there's, there's a little bit of a, a knee-jerk reaction to just clamp things down when really what we need to do is be collaborative and, um, and, and work together with, with all of our friends around the world. In, in, internally in communication, you know, one thing about uh, Google, which, which people may not know, is that one of the reasons that Google won, it wasn't preordained, obviously, um, uh, uh, by Richard Feynman or any, any religious figure, um, it, but the, one of the reasons they won, they beat the other search engine companies, is they figured out a way to have servers fail. So servers were really expensive. They were like $20,000 a pop. And Google figured out a way to say, let's buy cheap servers, build Lego chassis for them. There's literally a Lego chassis for a, a Google server uh, in, the, in the Gates building uh, down, the, down the road. Uh, and we'll deal with the errors. We'll be able to detect errors. So it's kind of analogous to qubits, right? I mean, it's a little bit. Um, but communicating internally um, is, is really important. Uh, there was a paper written here at, at Stanford Law School about I don't know, uh, 15 years ago, called Cathedral's Bizarre Continua. Um, and I, I don't remember if I was part of it or not because it was a million years ago, but going to Florian's point, you know, if you, if you say everything is open source, 
what happens is you might get alchemy, right? People doing things in their basements, literally basements in the case of uh, quantum chips. Um, you know, and, and, and that could be in Colorado Springs, or it could be here, or it could be Beijing, or wherever. Um, if you have it all completely proprietary, you reinforce a proprietary regime, you have patent thickets, right? And you have many of the problems that Mark Lemley and others and, uh, and Moritz and his collaborators have been talking about, right? And, and that's a disaster too. You can have flow between those two things, and as Dr. Chow said, having a lab environment is really helpful, both for the governance on these things as the other things. So I, I would encourage us to be building, you know, government's lab, gov governance labs, right? Be thinking about different ways that we can optimize the, the legal problem uh, to, to make sure that the science and the, the benefit to humanity gets uh, it's happening. We have time for questions, I think, and there's some other uh, questions. Uh, there's one in the back to start. I don't know if you heard it, but let me repeat the question. So, for, so in the slide that you showed about how using simulated, which I understand that they're simulated on top of general purpose or GPUs, right? How does the training phase compare in terms of the things that you were talking about later, like cost, energy, speed? I mean, it's just because if it is everything great, my question is why don't we just put that software stack on top of the training? And what is the drawback, essentially, of the... Um, you had better prediction, but what is the drawback of what you showed? Thanks. So just uh, that I get it right, you're interested in the simulator that I showed yes. in the slide. Yes. So uh, that's one thing that we do that is correct. Um, and uh, we have a simulator that goes up to 42 simulated qubits right now. And uh, we do that because physical quantum chips, um, they're error prone, so they're not perfect, as we heard a couple of times today. And um, uh, there is also some other issue with physical quantum chips with this connectivity. So how many qubits can you connect to other qubits? So the less um, you can connect to one qubit, the more space you need physically on the chip to embed the problem, to solve a problem. So and these simulated qubits, uh, they are um, fully connected. So now the question is, is it uh, equivalent to a physical quantum chip that would be perfect? It's not. No? no, no, no. no? Uh, if, you use, uh, hmm? if I were to use a general purpose computer yes. and using non-quantum software, because it's just a yes. software stack, yes. right? how do the two compare? I mean, I did the same chips, same GPUs. Yeah. What, are the what would be, because if there is no drawback, I, I know why people would use non-quantum algorithms. Yeah. So and that, that is the, the point exactly. So when you simulate a physical quantum chip, so that's what it is, it emulates the behavior of that chip somehow, and, uh, or to some degree. And that means it can do things that are inherent to quantum computing. So it is not comparable to the hardware only that we would use without the quantum simulator. That's not the question. There's not a question. For example, if, the, if you have an energy budget yes. to spend on a bunch of chips, yes. and I put software that is non-quantum, and I spend it, I mean, is there any gain of using non-quantum? I mean, what I'm trying to say is that why would people not use quantum algorithms on general purpose simulated if they are so good? I mean, what is the drawback of not using them? So, so the, uh, maybe I'm still get, not getting it right, but the, the drawback. Talk later. I'm, I'm <laughs> no, the, the actual drawback why we don't do that or why we use the simulators today is just uh, that the physical quantum chips come with errors. No, that's not, not what I'm asking. What I'm saying, if I am a software At, developer, yes. I'm a software developer, and I can use, I have a bunch of hardware that I have bought. I put on, on top of it software that is non simulating quantum bits. Yes. And I get a given performance in terms of energy budget. Uh, so maybe, we, maybe we tackle that in we'll a. We'll take it offline. Yeah, <laughs> uh, that's great. We hope this is the beginning of a conversation with the panelists and in general, not the end. So thank you so much. I think, I think it's about a, you know, where do you put your energy budget and, and why does it make sense to, to have quantum at all in some sense? But uh, we, can, we can take that offline. There was another question right here, I believe. Uh, there's a mic. Thanks, Jody. Thanks so much for the organizers, yeah. I have a question to, to Grant. Um, so you seem to suggest that you also allow other firms to experiment on your service, on your, on, on your cloud, and maybe you can talk a bit about your experiences in, in how that collaboration works and, and whether that can be a solution to the, to the regulation conundrum that, that we're seeing. And, I wanted to ask you specifically on the use case of financial services that you talked about. So do you see any just incremental changes or is it really a revolution in the making? Because the, I mean, the, the, the themes that you had on the slides are, if I may say, you know, nothing brand new. I mean, they, they've been problems with high frequency trading all the time and AI as well. So what is really the, the new big thing in town in that field? 
Thanks. Right. So the, uh, mm -hmm. two questions. Right. The, the first one was about yeah, using yeah, using sorry. the AWS yeah. uh, services, Amazon Bracket service. Yeah. That's generally available. Anybody can go and use it right now. There's even some free tiers. So you can just go and like try things uh, right now. Pull up your laptops, log in, and get going. Um, that so my experience with using that is uh, that that it's been it's good. The 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 main the main I think right now since it's such early days and the devices that we have access to are so so new. The main uh, set of people I think personally that that can benefit from this are those that are trying to get started, or trying to learn, or who are trying to develop proof of concepts to sort of work towards an end goal such that they've got something ready when the, the, the workhorse devices are available down the road. Um, is it a way of getting around some sort of government, governance issues? I think, you know, long term, longer term, this access model is going to be the, the right way to go, right? These things are, are sensitive. They require all kinds of, they, <laughs> they require nobody in the building to sneeze at the wrong time, right? Like it, it's, it's sort of a, di a difficult problem. So having them be in a, a carefully controlled environment and then ac access through the outside world and have them interact nicely with classical devices to have these hybrid quantum classical uh, ways of computing. That's going to be, I think, the way, the way forward. So uh, I'm optimistic that, that down the road that'll work. On the financial use cases, you're, you're right that the, the topics that I was showing there, these are, these are not new. They're, you know, they're old problems. Uh, there's been Nobel Prizes awarded for how you solve these things analytically. Um, these are, the, these are the topics that keep coming up time and again. There are problems that customers do want to solve uh, and spend money on, on classical compute to do so. And the question is, are there ways of solving these problems more efficiently in some metric that you choose uh, using a quantum computer or a quantum solution? So I can, I can give you just you know, in, a, in a second uh, a recent collaboration that I had. There's some, some, a couple of papers that came out of this was done jointly with Goldman Sachs. And the question was, if you were to do portfolio optimization using a quantum algorithm that was proposed for solving that, that problem, uh, what would it look like to actually run this on a device? How expensive is it, is it in terms of the, the number of qubits and the expensive computational gates that, are, that we'd like to, to talk about? And the reason that, that this is an interesting problem is because it's not just sufficient to say, here's an algorithm, somebody could run this and solve the problem. That, that in principle, is a, is a great message, but it doesn't necessarily mean that you can actually run that algorithm in practice uh, just because the resource overheads may actually be prohibitive. And in this particular case, that turned out to be what we found. Uh, and so I think the reason that this is uh, an area of interest is because the kinds of problems that quantum computers are likely able to solve in the long term tend to be the sort of the nugget of complexity in, uh, let's say, financial services, just as an example. Um, and the question is, now, are we actually able to use them? And if so, what would it look like to do this? How far down the road is this, if at all? And so doing some of this cutting edge research is, is necessary to be able to say, ah, I see, here's a giant bottleneck. We're not going to be able to overcome this without a whole new way of thinking. And then you, you, uh, you move down that road. Sure. Wonderful. Uh, other questions? Elijah? Yeah, thanks. Really interesting talk. Uh, question for the uh, team up there. Um, uh, say one of the issues with the governance of quantum is, for example, in the far future when we have a scalable fault-tolerant quantum computer, um, uh, whether private corporations, for example, will have to keep an eye on what customers will use potential cloud access for. Um, how would you see that playing out? And again, I'm grossly oversimplifying, but how would you stop a customer uh, jumping on your cloud service and using it to, for example, run Shaw's algorithm or some form of Shaw's algorithm? Um, how would you do that? Given at the moment, I understand you actually don't pay that much attention to what, what algorithms are actually being run on the cloud. Uh, anyway, Karina, do you want to take that to start? Uh, yeah, it's a good question. It's also a hard one. It's also, I guess, not unique to quantum computing. Certainly something that we've seen um, in the past and, you know, even at Google currently thinking about with respect to AI, right? And, you know, all the different ways that AI, large language models, other elements can be used. Um, to what degree can we as a technology provider um, follow up on all of the different applications and, and to what degree and um, where does our responsibility lie? Um, I think that we're thinking about this, um, maybe I'll share kind of like current thinking and then certainly 
whenever we have that fault tolerant quantum computer, you know, hopefully, you know, maybe thinking's, um, you know, even improved and evolved. Um, right now, right, I think there's a number of different elements. One, you think about open source, you know, you look at the open source licenses, Creative Commons, you know, all, all the different licenses there. The very definition of that is that you make it available and that people are free to do what they choose with it, right? And so um, to the degree that it makes sense to publish things under uh, open source and that, you know, this is something that uh, others uh, in the ecosystem are aware of and, and governments say, hey, yes, this is still a very useful tool. You know, we'll try to figure out how to, you know, best govern what's happening with open source. That's kind of the definition of the license. There's also kind of the next step of things that were not open source, but maybe provided through cloud access via APIs and things like that. In those cases, Google and other cloud providers or other, you know, technology developers certainly have a bit more control, right? Because there's terms of service, there's customers. Um, one of the things that we've looked at and certainly installed, for example, in some of our cloud AI APIs is to actually put specifically into the terms of service um, the different ways under which um, we think that the technology should be used. Um, we certainly embed, for example, you know, operation in accordance with the Google AI principles. There's a lot of other, um, I think there was a question over here that was um, raised by the gentleman in the front around like actual, you know, technical standards and performance too. Like, is it is it operating within these XYZ benchmarks that you would expect? Does it have this performance? That's the kind of, um, regime in which it does make sense to apply this type of model. That's the kind of way that we're thinking about it. That being said, once you have that, you cannot follow up on every single way that it, if a customer breaks the terms of service, I guess if that comes to your um, awareness, then maybe that's a place where you would have also baked into the license um, kind of subsequent consequences, taking away access, maybe other things like that. Um, but I think you know that's a place where if we wanted to go down that path. Certainly companies, governments, um, academia too, thinking about the problem we need to work together. I think that's a wonderful uh, way, to, way to close. We need territories where we can communicate. Uh, and having, and by the way, if you're a small company, a patent can enable you to do that. A patent can enable commerce because finally you can talk to a third party that's a giant uh, without you know, just losing your ability to commercialize. So it should enable commerce and create a better equilibrium between trade secret and, and uh, versus patent. But we also need uh, open source as well. And so we need all of that to, to, to optimize uh, what's gonna happen. With that, Moritz, I see you assembling an instrument. Thank you so much to the panelists. Uh, and I hope at the beginning, uh, not the end.